from Rixie. This is Debuff, and I'm your host, Steve Skeels. Today, I'll be talking about the next-gen consoles. Both are about to launch, and that's all most outlets are talking about right now. So I'll go over both the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series consoles, getting a bit into what the reviews are saying, the next-gen games, and console availability. Starting off with what people are saying, and I'll begin with the PlayStation 5. Overall, it seems like everyone holds the console in high regard. It runs well, and has some software updates that I think many will like. The console itself is huge, of course, but I like the design myself, and it seems like many of the reviewers have come around since the initial reveal. It's definitely going to give some people setups some issues, but it's good to know that the main reason for its size is the cooling system. Hopefully we won't have any issues with this console overheating. The menus on the console are sleek, if a bit familiar, with the quality of life improvements and new features in the UI being pretty useful. The card system even appears to be more well done than I expected, with Polygon citing the ability to easily jump into Devil May Cry 5's training mode when you want to brush up on a character or weapon. It makes it really easy to do things like that, just with a few clicks of the buttons. Even the hints given for some games are pretty in-depth, with 180 videos made for Demon Souls. Though again, how helpful those will be may be debatable for different people, and I doubt every game will be going that far. It's definitely left up to the developers themselves, and I feel like a lot of third-party games are not going to be doing as much to help out. There are even some neat options that weren't shown off before, like a global setting to invert the Y-axis, or set the console to performance or resolution mode, with even more options in specific games. The SSD definitely improves load times, as we would expect, with IGN reporting the PlayStation 5's capability of reading 5.5 gigabytes in just over one second. That's crazy. It takes less than a minute from powering on to swinging around to Spider-Man, a huge upgrade from previous generations. The only downside of this hard drive is that it currently only has 667 gigabytes of usable space. There is a slot to be able to upgrade to more storage, but it is currently disabled with no Sony-approved drives available at launch. Perhaps most impressively, the console itself is very quiet, almost silent by many reviewers' notes. This is great, as the PlayStation 4 is loud as hell, with a lot of people calling it a jet taking off. This is all well and good, but I think the real upgrade here that will set it apart from the Xbox Series consoles is the DualSense controller. The haptic feedback and adaptive triggers being the main features. Many reviewers are touting it as a true game changer for console gaming. It's obviously something everyone will have to feel to understand, similar to the HD rumble in the Switch's Joy-Cons. But I think once more people get their hands on it, they will feel the same way, myself included. It sounds like a seriously cool way to add some immersion in games without completely shifting how we play to something like motion controls or VR. The only real negatives I've heard are some people saying it's a bit more uncomfortable than the DualShock 4, which is already not many's favorite controller in the first place. Some have also reported poor battery life, but I couldn't find much evidence of this as many people were saying it's pretty similar to the DualShock 4s itself. Again, overall, it seems like the PlayStation 5 is a big upgrade, just as we would expect, and a lot of people are enjoying their time with it, though there are a few games to play, which we'll get into a bit later. Now for the Xbox Series X, and a bit on the S as well. This seems to be reviewing well, pretty much just as well as the PlayStation 5, and I think a big part of it is that they learned their lesson with the Xbox One launch and have made some strides to improve their offerings this time around. Polygon has taken to calling the Series X boring, but in a good way. It plays it safe, both in its design, however fridge-like you want to say it is, and in what it adds to what the Xbox One did. The UI itself is pretty much the same as the Xbox One layout, which is good for some, as I think Microsoft has figured out what works, but it may be disappointing if you thought you might be getting a totally different experience with the Series line. The Series X is fairly compact when compared to the PlayStation 5, and its tower design is much more tame than Sony's designers went with. I personally like both, but I think a lot of people are going to think that the Series X looks a bit better, looking similar to something like a computer tower. The Series S, on the other hand, is obviously much smaller than both, and it looks much more familiar to previous generations. Either the Series S or X shouldn't have too much of an issue fitting into someone's entertainment center, though it might be a bit difficult with how wide the Series X is. 
On paper, the Series X is definitely more powerful than the PlayStation 5, though we'll have to see how much of a difference it will make for third-party games. Obviously, the Series S is less powerful, and seemingly even less powerful than an Xbox One X. There are a lot of people that have gone into more detail on that, but I think it doesn't really matter to most people that are going to go for the cheaper console in the first place. It's still going to be a great way to get next-gen games at a low price. And similar to the PlayStation 5, the Series X has some games that offer an increase in frame rate, up to 120 hertz, at the cost of your resolution. For some games like competitive fighters, this might be a nice option. Overall, the thing is much faster than what we've seen with the previous generation, again owed to the SSD. The hard drive itself is bigger than the PlayStation 5's offering, with 802 gigabytes of usable space. However, upgrading to more space on the console will require getting Microsoft's proprietary memory sticks, potentially with some options coming later down the line, but those things are pretty expensive. IGN did measure it at running about half the speed of the PlayStation 5, though this may be a matter of optimization. In either way, it's still fast as hell, and I don't think a lot of people are really going to notice the difference between one and two seconds, compared to what we deal with on the current gen. And one thing that the Xbox has over PlayStation this time is the quick resume feature, letting you suspend multiple games at once and resume within five to 10 seconds, exactly where you left off. This is a game changer. Even if you don't plan to be playing many games at once, it's still a fantastic feature that works even from a completely powered down state. It takes almost no time to turn on your console and get right back into the game. A huge upgrade from some of the ridiculous load times that we're currently dealing with. And even if you only play a few games at a time, it might be nice to be able to pause your single player game and jump right into some multiplayer with a friend, without having to worry about saving or finding a good spot to stop. Many are saying that this feature alone makes it difficult to go back to the Xbox One, and I can imagine this is true. Even playing games that you're dealing with right now, being able to jump in and out of multiple games is just really awesome and I think something that a lot of people have been waiting for. Controller, on the other hand, is a minor update when compared to the PlayStation 5's DualSense, with the share button being pretty much the only new feature. However, people love the Xbox controller, so I don't really think there's a need to change it. And unlike the PlayStation 5, you can use your current-gen controller to play next-gen games, so it's going to be really handy to not have to buy new controllers just to run some couch co-op with a friend. And really, I'm not hearing anything bad about the Xbox One in general. It's essentially a straight upgrade, though without much different on the software side. But I don't think that's a problem. You're going to get a better experience and basically be doing the same things you're doing right now on your Xbox One. I think that's awesome, and while I like what the PlayStation 5 did with its new UI, I do feel like a lot of people are going to want to go with the tried and true on the Xbox. Now to talk briefly about the games. Let's be real, launch lineups are never really that great. Most of the time, they are filled with cross-gen games and a few new titles to help justify the purchase. Hell, the Nintendo Switch launched with pretty much just Breath of the Wild, and the only reason that worked for them is because no one had a Wii U, and people liked the Switch's gimmick. But for some reason, I'm feeling a bit down on this launch lineup. Neither console has any must-have games, really, other than maybe Demon Souls on the PlayStation 5. But that's a remake, and if you've played it before, or waited this long without playing it, I'm sure you can probably wait for a little while longer. With many titles being cross-generation, even some exclusives like Miles Morales, you'll get a smoother, faster experience on the new consoles, but it's not much of an improvement otherwise, and if you don't want to shell out the $500 to play on the next console, then you pretty much can just play on whatever you've got now. This isn't to say that there aren't any games to play, though. The PS5 does have a few exclusives, though Miles Morales and Sackboy are also on the PlayStation 4 as well. But unfortunately, I don't think that the Xbox has too much going for it. They kind of missed out with the exclusive killer app due to the Halo Infinite delay, but that's all right. The cross-gen releases will take advantage of the next-gen hardware, with some even having free upgrades to the next console should you choose to upgrade at a later date. And of course, backwards compatibility will also add tons of your games to the catalog for your new console. So if there's something you want to replay or have yet to play, I'm sure you'll get a better experience from using these next gens. Honestly though, looking at the games, I feel like it's not a bad idea to wait a while if you haven't already pre-ordered the console. The new machines are of course enticing, 
but without much new to play on them, it's just going to feel like a faster box that you spent hundreds of dollars on. If that's your thing, then go for it, but I think I'm personally going to wait a bit. Especially since it sounds like it's going to be difficult to get a console if you haven't pre-ordered already. The PlayStation 5 will straight up not be available in stores at launch, only available for purchase online. This is apparently a safety measure due to COVID-19, which I find understandable. At the moment, the Xbox Series X and S are both planned to be in-store and online, but it's going to be difficult to pick one up in person. Stock will likely be limited, and some places like Target have stated that you're pretty much going to have to order online anyways and just choose to pick it up in the store. Online orders themselves have proven to be difficult, as we saw with the initial sales for both consoles. It will require checking availability and hoping you're fast enough to purchase it before it goes out of stock. This isn't uncommon for a new console, but it's likely that the stock will be more limited than normal due to COVID. Even despite potential production reasons, it seems like everyone is really going to be going for the new consoles this year. Due to COVID, I think everybody's been gaming a lot more than normal, and there isn't really much else to do, so why not get the next console? Regardless, I wish everyone luck in trying to get one. Like I said, I'm probably going to hold off myself, but we'll see if I see one for sale online and try to pull the trigger. But again, without too many games to play, I'm probably just going to stick to my consoles and PC that I have now. Debuff is hosted by me, Steve Skeels, edited and mixed by Mason Carlton. Follow us on Instagram at debuffpod. That's debuffpod. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next one.